Good morning, everyone. It is such an honor and privilege that, to have the opportunity to introduce such a phenomenal pillar in health disparities research. I was truly inspired and encouraged while reviewing his CV and gave honor to God for giving him the knowledge, skills, and courage to bless our society with his breadth of work. Dr. David R. Williams is the Florence and Laura Norman Professor of Public Health at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and Professor of African, African American Studies and Sociology at Harvard University. Previously, he served six years on the faculty of Yale University and 14 at the University of Michigan. He holds an MPH from Loma Linda University and a PhD in Sociology from the University of Michigan. Dr. Williams is an internationally recognized authority on social influences on health. He has been invited to keynote scientific conferences in Europe, Africa, Australia, the Middle East, South America, and across the United States, and now Mayo Clinic. The author of more than 400 scientific papers, his research has enhanced our understanding of the complex ways in which socioeconomic status, race, stress, racism, health behavior, and religious involvement can affect health. The everyday discrimination scale that he developed is one of the most widely used measures of discrimination in health studies. He has received numerous awards and honors. In 2001, he was elected to the National Academy of Medicine, and in 2007, to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He was the first non-white scholar to receive the Leo G. Reader Award from the American Sociological Association. He has also received the Stephen Smith Award for Distinguished Contributions in Public Health from the New York Academy of Medicine and an inaugural Decade of Behavior Research Award. He was ranked as one of the top 10 most cited social scientists in the world in 2005 and as the most cited black scholar in the social sciences in 2008. In 2014, Thompson Reuters ranked him as one of the world's most influential scientific minds. With funding from the National Institutes of Health and the sponsorship of the World Health Organization, Dr. Williams directed the first South African Stress and Health Study, the first nationally representative study of the prevalence and correlates of mental disorders in Sub-Sahara Africa. He also worked on ethnic inequities with the Toronto Public Health Department, the National Health Service in the UK, and the Pan American Health Organization. Dr. Williams has been involved in the development of health policy at the national level in the United States. He has served on the National Committee of Vital and Health Statistics, and on eight committees for the National Academy of Medicine, including the committee that produced the unequal treatment report. He also served as a member of the MacArthur Foundation's research network on socioeconomic status and health. He's played a visible national leadership role in raising awareness levels of the problem of health inequities and identifying interventions to address them. This includes his service as the staff director of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's Commission to Build a Healthier America, and as a key scientific advisor to the award-winning PBS film series, Unnatural Causes, is inequity making us sick. He or his research has been featured by some of the nation's top print and television news organizations. In fact, Dr. Williams and I published an article together in the American Journal of Hypertension entitled, Association of Race Consciousness with the Patient-Physician Relationship, Medication Adherence, and Blood Pressure in Urban Primary Care Patients. Our findings were featured on CNN in 2014 in the aftermath of the Ferguson, Missouri Uprising on Race Relations in America. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Williams. Thank you so very much, La Princess, for your very kind and comprehensive introduction. <laughs> Trying to see if I can bring up my slides here. I can. 
All right. So what I want to do today, and I'm thrilled that we have a lot of time to discuss the issues that I will talk about, is give you an overview. Uh, as, opposed, as opposed to focusing on specific studies, I will focus on a few specific studies, but try to give you the big picture overview of the challenges um, of inequities in health in the United States. Um, with an emphasis on racial ethnic inequities in health, but they have to be understood in the context of larger socioeconomic inequities in health, as well as geographic inequities in health. And then what are some of the challenges and opportunities that we have um, in terms of, of addressing these underlying inequities in health? So I'm gonna jump right into my talk. So we have, I have a lot of territory to cover and I wanna leave plenty of time uh, for conversation. So what are the health problems we face um, in the United States? The number one health problem, um, the number one disparity, the number one inequity is that the US is not the healthiest nation in the world. Um, we spend more money per person and more money absolutely than any other country in the world. According to the World Bank, half of the money spent on medical care in the world annually is spent in the United States. We are less than 6% of the world's population, consume one half of its medical resources, but rank near the bottom of the industrialized world on health, and we are losing ground over time. So for example, in 1980, we ranked 11th in the world on life expectancy. In 2014, we ranked 35th, behind countries like South Korea, Greece, Cyprus, Cuba, and Lebanon are countries that have higher life expectancy than the United States. And we'll talk about inequities in health. It's not just the minorities that are doing badly. If white America were a country, it would have ranked in 2014 as 34th in the world on life expectancy. If black America were a country, it would have ranked 96th. So I, I want us to begin with a clear recognition that although there are these inequities in health, we really need to develop strategies that not only reduce the inequities in health, but improve the health of all Americans because all of us are doing uh, more poorly than we could or, or should be. Um, what are the drivers of these inequities? A big one is socioeconomic status. I was trained as a soci sociologist. And when we say socioeconomic status, we refer to differences by income, education, occupational status, and wealth. Um, socioeconomic status is a central determinant of virtually every desirable resource in society. So I'll give you one of them that you, it's not as far removed from health as you might think, but the SAT test, the Scholastic Aptitude Test, which some are calling the Student Affluence Test because of the powerful relationship between SAT scores and socioeconomic status. So here's data uh, from 2014 looking at nationally at SAT scores by household income. And you can see as we go from household income of less than 20,000 all the way up to $200,000 a year, you see this straight line uh, stepwise increase in SAT scores with every higher level of, of household income. It's really even for diversity and a really an important issue for us to think about, about what these scores really capture um, they clearly are capturing exposure to socioeconomic resources and raises questions of how we should use them and, and make sense of them. But what is true of the SAT scores is also true of, of health in the United States. And just to give you one example of a study we did many years ago, looking at a panel study of income dynamics, it's one of the uh, large-scale studies in the U.S. that started in 1965, and the households in that study have been interviewed every year since then, um, and the study gets larger over time because their children get added as they start their own households. So we looked at the relationship between a very elegantly measured um, economic status, a study done by economists, um, and, um, and health. And you can see here's the relative risk of health compared to Americans with incomes of uh, $115,000 or more. You can see that low-income Americans have three times the risk of overall mortality, and every higher level of income is associated with lower risk. So we also see not that socioeconomic status effect is not a threshold effect. It's not that once you move from poverty socioeconomic status doesn't matter, but it matters at every level of, of um, economic status. 
Um, and then that would give us a hint if socioeconomic status is such a powerful predictor of health. And by the way, I'll show you data on this, but to deepen the, the, the point, I'll, I'll re say it now. In national data for most outcomes, socioeconomic status is a stronger predictor of variations in health than is race ethnicity. It's an interesting sociology of knowledge question why as a nation we focus almost exclusively on data by race ethnicity and seldom pay attention to SES, where SES predicts more strongly than socioeconomic status, and I'll give you an example of that. Um, so, um, but there are large racial ethnic differences in socioeconomic status, so just the socioeconomic data would tell us to expect racial ethnic differences in health. I think if you think of race and health, I think there are two primary patterns in, in US data, and that is groups that have been in the United States for a long time, characterized by economic exploitation, social stigmatization, geographic marginalization, where we really talk about uh, urban segregation or, or, or isolation on, on Native American reservations, um, those groups have much poorer health outcomes. True of blacks or African Americans, I'll use the term interchangeably. Native Americans or American Indians, Alaska Natives use those terms interchangeably, but also true for Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders. These groups show a very similar uh, pattern of health. Immigrant groups tend to have better health than the US average. In fact, with using national data for the United States on overall mortality or infant mortality, Immigrants of all racial ethnic groups have better health than their native, the native born counterparts. White immigrants have better health than whites born in the US. Black immigrants have better health than blacks born in the US. Um, Asian immigrants have better health than Asians born in the US. Latino immigrants have better health than Latinos born in the US. Across the board, there's a healthy immigrant effect. That's the good news. The bad news is the longer immigrants stay in the United States, the worse their health becomes. It's as if the data is saying there's something about the American way of life that's dangerous to your health. So greater levels of exposure and acculturation to American society is generally associated with poorer health. And so Asians is a group most heavily made up of immigrants. 70% of Asians in the United States are immigrants, and about 40% of Latinos also are immigrants. So if we look at infant mortality, one example, um, you can see the pattern, the towering excess risk uh, for African Americans and for Native Americans, and you see um, the Hispanics and Asian categories have uh, levels that are very similar to that of the white population. One of the really important things uh, to keep in mind if you're doing studies of, of, of immigrant populations is to separate outcomes by nativity status um, because you sometimes see dramatic divergence just by nativity status. I'll give you an example. I've been involved with colleagues at the University of Michigan in a, a large study um, uh, of, of residents, adult residents of Chicago. It's a representative sample, over 3,000 adults. In Chicago, it's about a third black, a third white, a third Latino. For every health outcome we've looked at, for every risk factor we've looked at, if we look at black, whites, Latinos, blacks are the worst, whites are the best, and Latinos are intermediate. But for everything we've looked at, if we simply break out Latinos by, are you US born or foreign born? We see a very consistent pattern. Foreign born Latinos, look like whites, and US-born Latinos look like African Americans. And you miss that disparity if you just keep Latinos as a group. So thinking of nativity status and immigrant status, and if you can even get generational status even better, it tells you a much more complex pa uh, pattern of where the subgroups of risk are within um, immigrant uh, populations. I wanted to highlight a, a striking pattern um, in the health uh, that has been best documented for the health of African Americans. Um, and that is um, what some scholars call accelerated aging, or some scholars call it premature aging, um, or Alan Geronimus calls it uh, weathering. Um, and that is, there is dramatic earlier onset of the disease, an emerging body of evidence to suggest that these minority populations are literally aging more rapidly um, than the rest of the population. Uh, I'll give you just a couple quick examples of this phenomenon. The cardia is a cardiovascular disease, multi-site cardiovascular disease study that started with young adults ages 18 to 20, um, and they have now been followed for over 25 years. Um, a, a paper published from the cardia study looked at incident heart failure before the age of 50, 
and found that it was 20 times more common in blacks than in whites. Not twice as high, not five times as high, but 20 times more common in, in blacks and whites. Uh, this is a study that Arlene Geronimus did. Um, it's an old study, although the pattern is, is still consistent. It, it's really very striking. She looked at neonatal mortality, deaths of infants, in the first month of life by the age of mother. Um, she, this, is a, this is not a sample. This is all first births in the United States in a given year. And we would expect to find, we think, um, that socioeconomically, it's a good thing for women to delay childbearing. We also think biologically it's a good thing that if a woman delays childbearing from her teen years to her 20s, risk will be lower. The babies will have better outcomes. What she found, looking at whites and blacks and Mexican immigrants, Mexicans, heavily made up of immigrants, and Puerto Ricans, this is mainland uh, resident Puerto Ricans, um, that the patterns diverged dramatically. So that this is the death rate, neonatal death in the first month of life, um, among whites, white teens, if whites and Mexicans delay um, having their first baby from their teen years to their 20s, the risks actually go down. That's exactly what we would expect. The opposite pattern is true for African Americans and for Puerto Ricans, that risk actually goes up with delayed childbearing, even to 20 to 24. The, the risk is higher than it is for 15 to 19. And she was left with, and remember, it's not a sample. It's all first births in the United States in a given year. How do you make sense of patterns going in opposite directions for, two, for groups living in the same society? Arlene Geronimo said, weathering. What does she mean by weathering? Imagine a drop of water falling from the rooftop of this building to the concrete sidewalk below. If there are a few drops of water today, it has no impact on the concrete sidewalk. But if there's a constant, steady drip, drip, drip of water, day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out, the sidewalk below becomes weathered. It becomes eroded because of the constant exposure to adversity. And Arlene Geronimo says that for minorities in the United States, your age is not only capturing how long you have lived, it's also capturing how long you've been exposed to bad environmental conditions, and therefore how physiologically compromised you are becoming because of those exposures. There's a lot of evidence now, and I'll just give you two quick examples, it, consistent with this notion of, of, of premature aging and, and greater biological weathering uh, that is linked to age. So here is a national data for the United States from the NHANES study using 10 markers of, of biological functioning that the researchers called allostatic load. Um, and the way it was calculated, the higher the score reflects a higher level of physiological dysregulation or a higher level of risk. So if you look here at the allostatic load, the higher the score, the worse, uh, of whites age 55 to 64, you can see African Americans reach that same level of biological dysregulation 10 years earlier. So there's a 10-year gap between blacks and whites uh, linked to chronological age in terms of biological aging. Or here's another study that looked at, used telomere length uh, as a marker of biological aging and looked at middle-aged um, African-American and whites, um, uh, so they did the same chronological age, and found that Af black women had shorter telomeres length that corresponded, and their white counterparts, same chronological age, that corresponded to accelerated biological aging of seven and a half years. So there, there are multiple examples of indicating this dramatic earlier onset of disease that suggests there are fundamental biological processes by which minorities are aging more rapidly. Another striking pattern of um, the inequities in health is their persistence over time. 
So here's life expectancy from 1950 to 2010, the only group that we have uh, national data on going back uh, to 1950 um, is, is African Americans and whites. Um, and there's good news in these data. You could see there was an eight-year gap in life expectancy between blacks and whites in 1950. Um, there's a four-year gap in 2010, so we've cut the, the, the life expectancy gap uh, in health uh, by half. So that's good news. Um, there's also good news for both blacks and whites. You can see a steady increase in life expectancy over time. But there are some patterns here that, that are quite striking. Um, in 2010, there's still a four-year gap in life expectancy. If we froze the life expectancy of whites and had a life expectancy of blacks increase at the average rate at which national levels of life expectancy has increased in the last 10 years, it will take about 28 years to close this black-white gap. So a four-year gap is, is quite uh, considerable. In fact, look at these data, you can see those patterns. The life expectancy of whites at birth in 1950 was 69.1 years. Let's ask how long did it take for blacks to achieve the life expectancy, the overall health that whites had in 1950? It was not until 1990, 40 years later, that blacks had the health that whites had in 1950. So how do we make sense of these racial inequities? Uh, my contention would be um, that you can't make sense of them without understanding the nature of racism in American society and the ways in which it operates. And so I want to talk about the house that racism built. Um, and I'm arguing that racism is part of the structure of society. Um, it's undergirded by an uh, ideology of inferiority that some groups uh, are better off than others, which was embedded in Article I of the United States Constitution, where, where blacks um, were to be counted as three-fifths of a person, whites would be counted, uh, and Indians would not be counted at all unless they were civilized Indians. Um, it wasn't until the 1920s that in a generous <coughs> act that Congress voted to grant U.S. citizenship to all American Indians. Prior to that, Native Americans were not even citizens of the United States. So what do I mean by racism? I see racism not as an individual characteristic or a group characteristic, but as a system uh, premised on the categorization and ranking of social groups that devalues and disempowers and differentially allocates desirable social opportunities and resources to groups regarded as inferior. I talked about the centrality of the ideology of inferiority, and it can lead to negative attitudes and beliefs, prejudice and stereotypes, and it can lead to differential treatment by both societal institutions, institutional discrimination, as well as individual level discriminations. discrimination. I think it's important to distinguish between individual and institutional discrimination. So I want to give you an example of both um, linked to waiting. So when someone stands at a crosswalk intending to cross the street. Does your race determine how long you have to wait to cross the street? Uh, researchers at Portland State University um, took three black males and three white males, dressed them similarly, and put them in intersections in Portland, Oregon, um, and had them demonstrate the same intent to cross the street. And what they found was that multiple cars were twice as likely to pass a black pedestrian waiting to cross the street and that blacks had to wait 32% longer to cross the street. Now, that reflects the behavior of individual drivers making decisions in terms of what they do. That's individual discrimination. Let's think of institutional discrimination linked to waiting. In the 2012 presidential election, your race determined how long you waited to vote at a precinct in the United States. So you could see, on average, African Americans waited 23 minutes, where whites, on average, waited 12 minutes, Latinos 19 minutes, Asians 15 minutes, and so on. Now, none of that reflected the behavior of precinct workers who were delaying some people based on their race in terms of voting. It instead reflected a number of institutional processes that were very clearly patterned by geography, the place where you went to vote. It reflected the amount of budgetary allocation, the amount of space that was available to vote, and the local administrative procedures that led to variations in the level of staffing and the size and the convenience with which people voted. But although it was institutional 
and there was no individual discrimination, there was still the outcome that your race, on average, determined how long you waited to vote. So that's an example of institutional discrimination. And my point would be that although institutional discrimination is not as visible, it is the most powerful ways in which racism operates in society and has dramatic impact on outcomes. Uh, let me give you an example of institutional discrimination by talking about one that politicians don't even talk about, um, segregation. Residential segregation by race is an example of institutional discrimination that has pervasive negative effects on health and, and access to opportunities in American society. Uh, residential segregation is a striking legacy of institutional racism. Um, it led to the isolation and marginalizations of native peoples and of blacks in the United States. And a very disturbing trend for scholars who study segregation is the increasing segregation of Latinos uh, in the United States. Um, so residential segregation, I wrote a paper in 2001 where I said it's the fundamental cause of racial disparities in health. And we are kidding ourselves if we think we are addressing racial disparities if we don't fundamentally address segregation, because segregation is, in fact, a driver. And I was not unique in saying that. Myrtle said it back in 1944. It was basic. Um, the Kerner Commission said it was the linchpin of US race relations in 68. Um, Douglas Massey and, and Nancy Denton, two sociologists who wrote a book about segregation called American Apartheid, said it is the key structural factor um, driving the perpetuation of black poverty and the missing link in efforts to understand urban poverty. John Sell was a historian at Duke University. He wrote a book on the origins of segregation in the US South and South Africa. The book is entitled The Highest Stage of White Supremacy. In the book, um, Cell shows how the framers of apartheid in South Africa looked across the Atlantic and saw American segregation and said brilliant, and they copied it uh, from the United States. Um, he also argues that residential segregation by race was, was one of the single most successful domestic policies of the 20th century in the United States because it's beneath the radar screen, but it has pervasive negative effects. And you're saying, what does segregation have to do with health? Well, place matters profoundly for health. Because where you live, for most Americans, determines where you go to school and the quality of education you receive. It determines access to employment opportunities. It determines the quality of housing and neighborhood environments. It determines whether you have access uh, to healthy foods, whether you have safe places to exercise, whether you have exposure to nearby nature. It determines the extent of physical, chemical exposures in residential environments. There's even research documenting places linked to the quality and access to medical care, to the cost of pharmacies, to how well stocked uh, the pharmacies you go to. It's linked to a broad range of city services, it's linked to social cohesion, social capital. So place is a powerful driver of health. One example, there are these maps that we did when I directed the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's commission to bring home the message of how powerful place is. And Steve Wolf, if you go to his website at Virginia Commonwealth University, he has maps of multiple cities in the United States. I just picked out the, the city of New Orleans as an example. And in this one city, in this small geographic space, you can get a 25-year difference in life expectancy just linked to which neighborhood in New Orleans you live in. And you can see it's 55 in one neighborhood, in another neighborhood it's 80. So dramatic differences in relatively small spaces uh, link to place. In fact, two of America's most eminent sociologists, William Julius Wilson, and Robert Sampson, studying the 171 largest cities in the United States, said there's not even one city where whites live under equal conditions to blacks, and that the worst urban context in which whites reside is considerably better than the average context of black communities, all of that driven by place and the legacy of residential segregation. And in fact, segregation is what is responsible for the large racial differences we see in socioeconomic status. I'm drawn on the work of another Harvard colleague, David Cutler, um, uh, one of the country's eminent e economists, using fancy econometric models I cannot even describe. He looks at a national sample of blacks and whites, uh, making it in the labor force, and documents that if you could statistically eliminate segregation, 
you would completely erase black-white differences in income, in education, and in unemployment, and reduce black-white differences in single motherhoods by two-thirds. All of that driven by the opportunities linked to place. So place and place-based strategies have to be central to any serious effort to address inequities in the United States. And how big are the gaps in socioeconomic status that exist in the United States? Let me draw on the most recent report, a 2016 report from the US Census Bureau of racial differences in income in the United States. And I've just translated it in a way you can't possibly miss the point. Uh, standardizing on a dollar of, 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 of income of whites. And for every dollar of household income whites receive, Asian households receive a dollar and 23 cents. Um, that data has to be contextualized by a couple points. One is that, as I mentioned before, Asian households are heavily made up of immigrants. Uh, they come to the United States with high levels of education. Most Asian groups have levels of college completion that's twice that of whites. Uh, for example, Asian households also have more persons contributing to household income on average. So if I did a per capita income measure, you'd have whites would have the highest levels of, of income in the United States. But for the other um, groups, for every dollar of income white households have, Latinos have 72 cents, um, Native Americans 62 cents, and African Americans 59 cents. This is 2015 data. What is striking about a 59 cents figure is that it's identical to the black-white gap in income in 1978. You've heard me right. In 1978, blacks earned 59 cents for every dollar whites earned. And in 2015, blacks earn 59 cents for every dollar whites earn. Most of my students think we have made much more progress in the United States than that. And why did I pick 1978? 1978 is the peak year of the gains from the policies of the civil rights policies and the anti-poverty policies of the 60s and early 70s. 78 was the biggest narrowing of the racial gap um, in income. But from 78, the gap widens. Throughout the decade of the 1980s, the gap widened from the 59 cents level. And it wasn't until 1994 that blacks got back up to where they were in 78. And they've been up and down since then, so that today they are no different from they were in 1978. And looking at racial differences in income dramatically understates racial differences in socioeconomic resources and economic status because income only captures the flow of resources into the household. It tells us nothing about the economic reserves that households have to cushion shortfalls of income. We get that from looking at data on wealth. Wealth are your economic reserves, your home equity, your savings, uh, your economic assets um, uh, that you have. And in the most recent data from the Census Bureau, uh, based on 2011, the 2014 report, for every dollar of wealth that white households have, black households have six pennies and Latino households have seven pennies. The racial gap in wealth today is larger than it was when President Obama took office because during the economic downturn and the housing crisis, blacks and Latinos had disproportionate losses of home equity and home ownership. And home equity is one of the biggest sources of wealth in the typical uh, American household. What is the take home point though? Is that these racial differences in SES that we sometimes just control as a confounder, um, uh, you know, they are not random events. They are not acts of God. They reflect the successful implementation of social policy and they illustrate the powerful ways in which racism has produced through an institutional mechanism that is not evident to most people, a truly rigged system uh, in the United States. When I started my career, most researchers believed that the racial differences in health was simply a function of racial differences in socioeconomic status. And that if we looked at blacks and whites, for example, at the same level of socioeconomic status, there would be no residual effect of race. We've now known that life is more complicated. So let me illustrate this with national data for the United States, looking at life expectancy at age 25. At age 25, whites, on average, live five years longer than blacks. So there's a five-year gap in life expectancy at age 25. 
But if we look within whites by education, the gap between whites with a college degree and whites who have not finished high school is 6.4 years. Again, the socioeconomic gap, the same is true if we look by income, is larger than the racial gap. If we look within African Americans, similarly, the gap within African Americans is 5.3 years between African Americans with a college degree and African Americans who have not finished high school. Again, 5.3 is bigger than 5. The gap within African Americans is larger than the, the overall racial gap. However, if we look at every level of income or education, there still is a residual effect of race. So white high school dropouts live 3.1 years longer than black high school dropouts, and the gap actually widens as education increases. So there's a 4.2 year difference in life expectancy between whites with a college degree or more education and blacks with a college degree or more education. And here's one of the more stunning statistics I will show you today, um, is that in national data for the United States, blacks with a college degree or more education, they have the highest life expectancy of African Americans in the United States, but they have lower life expectancy than whites with a college degree, than whites with some college education, than whites with a high school completion. So these data powerfully tell us there is something profound about income and education that drives health. But there's something else about race that matters profoundly for health even after you've taken income and education into account. Why does race still matter after we've taken income and education into account? Research suggests there are four answers. I'm going to focus heavily on one, but there are four answers. One is that health is affected not just by your current socioeconomic status, but by your exposures to adversity over your entire life course. So we are taking a life course perspective, looking at what has happened to you um, over your entire life course, and we have research documenting the role of prenatal influences on health, and there's a body of research that first came out of Scandinavia, and now we have US data telling us exactly the same thing, that for example, in the life of a woman, preconception stress matters. So that the stressors, there's studies out of Scandinavia showing that a woman who experienced high levels of stress in the six months to a year before she became pregnant has a 50% increased risk of infant mortality linked to the preconception stress. And we have data from the US also documenting a relationship between preconception stress to um, birth, uh, birth, low birth weight risk in US national data. So take, take in of just even preconception influences, prenatal influences, as well as what you've exposed to over your life course matters for health. And so let's go back. The, the college educated African Americans are more likely to be first generational in that status, more likely to have experienced um, poverty and, and access to lower levels of, of a broad range of resources that promote health uh, in early childhood. Secondly, all indicators of socioeconomic status are not equivalent across race. What do I mean by that? National data tells us that blacks and Latinos receive less income at the same levels of education, have less wealth at equivalent levels of income, and have less purchasing power. And the purchasing power differences is an example of how life is not fair. Because African Americans and Latinos disproportionately are, are likely to live in undesirable places. But what research shows is the cost of goods and services are more expensive in undesirable places. Rent per square foot is higher in inner city neighborhoods than in suburban neighborhoods. The cost of insurance is higher. The cost of gas is higher. So a broad range of services are, are more expensive. And so a dollar in the hands of a minority, on average, does not stretch as far as a dollar in the hands of a white person. And then. Minorities also experience uh, multiple stresses, not only the greater exposure to stress, but the greater clustering of stress. And then personal experiences of discrimination and institutional racism are added pathogenic factors. And I'll talk a little bit more ab about that. So let's talk about individual discrimination. We talked about segregation, a powerful uh, mark of institutional discrimination. Let's talk about individual discrimination. I give you an example earlier documenting that there are racial differences in how long it takes to cross a street. 
um, there is elegant research, many, most of them from audit studies like the one I described, where you take individuals who are identical in every respect with the same resumes or some other way identical and look at the outcomes. And we now have overwhelming scientific data documenting the persistence of, of discrimination across a broad range of domains of society. I don't have time to talk about the specific studies, but there's, there's a lot of elegant data. Some of the experiences of discrimination, individuals may be aware of. And the question that I struggled with was to what extent are some of these experiences of discrimination a source of stress that would have negative effects on health similar to other types of stressful life experiences. So it was mentioned that one of the measures of discrimination I developed to capture this is the everyday discrimination scale. It doesn't capture all aspects of discrimination, although it captures chronic ongoing discrimination and has proven to be maybe the most predictive, well, one of, uh, a very predictive marker uh, of discrimination. And what is striking about this is that it captures little indignities, being treated with less courtesy, less respect, receiving poorer service, people acting as if they think you are not smart or if they're afraid of you, or acting as if they think you are dishonest or the better you are. A lot of little indignities. The, to, this is a, um, the American Psychological Association uh, did a national study in the United States in 2016. They do these annual surveys on stress in America, they're called. And in 2016, they focused on discrimination as a type of stress using the measures of discrimination. I developed both the major experiences of discrimination scale and the everyday discrimination scale. But this gives us a picture of the levels of discrimination, everyday discrimination. This is the percent of Americans by race who report receive experience in everyday discrimination at least at least almost every day or at least once a week. And the levels are were highest for Native Americans. That's new because in most national study, we don't have data on Native Americans. And on the measures of major experience of discrimination, Native Americans also reported the highest levels of discrimination. That is a contribution of this study because we, we don't have national comparative data on Native Americans. But you can see 23% uh, of African Americans and 90% of Latinos report experiencing these experiences very frequently. Just to illustrate how powerful uh, these data are, I'm drawing on a colleague, Dr. Tenney Lewis, was at Yale at the time she did this work. Every line on this study re represents a different uh, published peer-reviewed paper. In all of the studies, she looked at everyday discrimination as the exposure, and I think it just illustrates how powerful the effects are. So higher levels of everyday discrimination predicts um, uh, more rapid development of coronary artery calcification among individuals followed over five years. It predicts high levels of inflammation as measured by C-reactive protein. It predicts high levels of systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Pregnant women who report everyday discrimination give birth to lower birth weight infants. A study of the elderly followed over time. High levels of everyday discrimination predicts more rapid declines in cognitive functioning. A community sample, high levels of discrimination predicts poorer sleep. A study of adults followed over time, everyday discrimination is an independent risk factor of premature mortality. So it's literally killing people. A study of black and white women um, with an interest in abdominal fat, everyday discrimination was unrelated to subcutaneous fat, but strongly predicted high levels of visceral fat. So the, the type of abdominal fat that really predicts higher risk of cardiovascular disease and other outcomes, everyday discrimination. So that just illustrates uh, the broad range of outcomes and how powerful the effects of discrimination are. I want to illustrate something else about discrimination and join in the work of Gene Brody and his colleagues. Gene Brody in, from Georgia has been studying a cohort of African American teens, has measured discrimination in the teens at age 16, 17, and 18, and by age 20, by age 20, he is documenting um, biological dysregulation. The teens who are consistently high on discrimination as a teenager have higher levels of overnight cortisol, epinephrine, norepinephrine, systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, um, inflammation, and BMI at age 20. So the negative effects of discrimination are being manifested and evident very early in life to see not just that their mental health is affected, but that fundamental biological processes are affected as early. In another study that they have done using these same data, 
higher levels of discrimination as a teen predicts higher levels of what they are called an epigenetic aging by age 20. So premature aging is being documented, linked to discrimination as young as age 20. Most of the research on discrimination and health has not assessed the contribution that discrimination would make uh, to racial inequalities in health. But there are a few studies that have looked at, at this. And we have studies now from the United States, Australia, South Africa, and New Zealand that document the residual effect of race that remains after we've statistically adjusted for income education is further explained when we add measures of discrimination to the model. So the discrimination we now know makes an incremental contribution over and above income and education to explaining racial differences in health. Uh, as this study shows, it explains, helps to explain the gap in birth outcomes in the US, in healthcare trust, in sleep quality and physical fatigue, in sleep quantity and quality in the US. I would like to emphasize that discrimination must be assessed and understood in the context of a broader range of psychosocial stressors that, that minorities and other disadvantaged groups experience. I, I have encountered many well-meaning researchers who want to add the Williams nine-item measure of everyday discrimination to the scale to a study and now feel they've captured everything about minority life and everything about the exposures that individuals have. This is actually is not funny. It's quite, quite distressing to me. Um, and I, my point is discrimination has to be understood in the context of this broader range of stresses. So to illustrate this study we did in Chicago, we assessed eight domains of stress, acute life events is like unemployment and the loss of a loved one, um, and financial stress, the struggle to make ends meet by the end of the month. We looked at discrimination at work, we looked at early childhood adversity, we looked at work stressors, we looked at discrimination over the lifetime, major experiences in everyday discrimination, we looked at stressors in relationships, and we looked at stressors in the neighborhood environments. And what we find is that minorities not only have, this is an example where African Americans and US born Latinos have very similar stress across most of these domains and whites and and whites and foreign born Latinos have similar levels of stress uh, across those domains. But what is what's interesting is for African Americans and US born Latinos they not only have higher levels of stress but they have the greater greater clustering of stress. So if they have one of them, if they're high in one, they're more likely to be high on multiple indicators. And these are self-reported measures of health we, we use in, in this data set. I just wanted to illustrate it as we looked across multiple, look, looking at how many domains of stress the individuals are high on, we see this dose-response relationship for self-rated health, for higher levels of depressive symptoms, for higher levels of functional limitations, for higher levels of, of physician-reported uh, medical conditions they've been diagnosed on. So, so there's this dose-response relationship between the number of stressors. So if we capture in stress, if we fail to capture it comprehensively, we dramatically understate the role of stress in health. There's also concern about the extent to which discrimination in the larger environment affects health. So in the wake of September 11th, um, 2001, there was a well-documented increased harassment and discrimination of Arab Americans in the United States. Um, and this was most intense uh, for the six months after September 11th, certainly hasn't gone away, uh, and certainly is on an upswing now. Um, Diane Lauderdale, a demographer, decided to look at birth outcomes for women of all racial ethnic groups in the six months before September 11th and the six months after. And she documented, using data for the state of California, there were no differences in birth outcomes for black women, white women, Native American women, Latino women, um, Asian women in the state of California before and after September 11th. But for Arab American women only, in the six months after September 11th, they were more likely to give birth to low birth weight infants and to infants who were preterm in the six months after compared to the six months before. With no direct assessment of the stress, but exactly the window of time when the stress was most intense, there were consequences. Their studies documented negative consequences for the mental health of Arab Americans, documenting this was not just about their mental health, but it also had to do with even the, the unborn. So we are in an era of time where there is increased harassment and discrimination. 
uh, a study done during the last political campaign of over 2,000 K through 12 teachers found that 67% of the teachers report that their students express concerns or fears about what might happen to their families after the election. More than a third of teachers said they've seen an increase in anti-Muslim or anti-immigrant sentiment. More than half of this national sample of teachers report an increase in uncivil political discourse. More than half of the teachers say that some of their students are emboldened to use slurs and name calling and to say bigoted and hostile things about minorities, immigrants, and Muslims. And then in the wake of the Trump election, there's also been a spike in hate crime and harassment across the United States, which says that this stress in the larger environment is likely to have negative effects on health. The American Psychological Association did a study in January of 2017, this year, and found that high levels of the American population report that the outcome of the election is a very significant or somewhat significant source of stress in their life. And even among Republicans, 26% of Republicans report the outcome of the election as a significant source of stress compared to 72% of Democrats. So the, the stress generated by the current environment is something that we need to pay attention to. So we've talked about um, racism and its contribution as a part of, of discrimination, as segregation. There's also racism deeply embedded in the culture of American society that can have consequences embedded in stereotypes um, that can lead to implicit and explicit bias, can lead to high levels of stigma that also um, matter for health. I, I want to illustrate that the, the, the stigma and, and negative stereotypes don't, again, come out of thin air, but are deeply embedded in the culture of American society. So there's a group of researchers who have created a database of American culture. Um, within this database, they have put the books, newspapers, magazine articles that an average college-educated American would read over their lifetime. What's brilliant about this is that if you've put American culture into a database, you can now say when we look within American culture at the word black, for example, we can now tell what adjective most frequently co-occurs with blacks. Poor, violent, religious, lazy, cheerful, dangerous. When white occurs, wealthy, progressive, conventional, stubborn, successful, educated. For the fun of it, when, fe when male occur female occurs, distant, warm, gentle, passive. Male, dominant, leader, logical, strong. The numbers next to the words are a measure of associative strength. They're not simple correlation coefficients, but you can interpret them in the same way. The, the stronger they are, the more tightly tied these two words are, deeply embedded in American culture. Here are the 10 most common uh, stereotypes uh, in this analysis. Uh, of these data uh, for blacks and whites. You can see some negative stereotypes. I highlighted them for blacks and whites. Um, but you see for African Americans, the neg negative stereotypes are more predominant and, and they are stronger. Their associative strength is also greater. This has profound effects for what we're grappling with in the United States. This says to me that when a cop sees a young black male as violent and dangerous, and the more violent and dangerous than the situation actually indicates, we are not necessarily dealing with a bad cop. We may be simply dealing with a normal American who is reflecting what is deeply embedded in his subconscious as a result of being raised in this society. Because this is what he has been fed. This is what he's been socialized by this society, and he's simply acting out these things. Because research clearly indicates that these negative stereotypes that are deeply embedded trigger racial discrimination. Um, it was mentioned I served on the Institute of Medicine on Equal Treatment Report Committee that documented across virtually every therapeutic intervention, from the most simple to the most complex, blacks and other minorities receive poorer quality care and less intensive care than whites. It was true in academic medical centers, and it's true in small rural hospitals. It's true across the board. 
It was most documented in the treatment of cardiovascular disease, but it was documented in every area of medical care. And since 2003, there's been a spate of studies continuing to document the persistence of inequalities. For those of you who are not aware of these data, I will just give an example. Dr. Todd was an emergency room physician at UCLA Medical Center, and he asked a simple question. When a patient comes into the UCLA emergency room with a long bone fracture, broken bone in the arm or leg, does the patient's ethnicity determine whether or not he or she gets pain medication? And Dr. Todd found that 55% of Latinos treated at the emergency room in the past year with a long bone fracture had received no pain medication compared to 26% of non-Hispanic whites. And Dr. Todd was a good researcher, he said confounding. So statistically, he adjusted for whether this patient spoke English or not, whether they had insurance or not, whether they got injured on the job or not, what time they showed up in the emergency room, how long they spent in the emergency room, how severe was the fracture. And after statistically adjusting for all of these and other factors I haven't even mentioned, the single biggest predictor of whether a patient got pain medication was the patient was Latino. And Dr. Todd did a second study to say, could it be that Latinos are expressing their pain in some culturally distinctive way that the providers are just not cluing in on? And so he did a study having patients rate the pain they were in, having providers rate the, the pain they thought the patients were in, and looked at the differences and found that providers could equally detect the severity of pain in Latino patients than in white patients, but was systematically providing less pain medication for them. Dr. Todd moved from UCLA to Emory University in Atlanta and repeated the same study at three emergency rooms in Atlanta, looking at black and white patients and found the exact same thing. A black patient with a broken bone in the arm or leg shows up in an emergency room in Atlanta, is less likely to get pain medication. Remember, I just give pain medication as an example. It's not just about pain, it's about every area of medicine. This pattern exists. And so how on earth is it possible with the best trained medical workforce in the world where providers wake up in the morning to do their best for all of their patients can nonetheless produce a pattern of care that is so um, discriminatory. The IOM report concluded, looking at all of the evidence, the best single explanation, not the only one, but the best explanation was this phenomenon that social psychologists had studied for three decades called unconscious or unthinking discrimination or implicit bias, because the research shows that if you hold a negative stereotype about a group and you meet someone from that group, my next two words are important. It's an automatic process, so you do it without thinking. It's an unconscious process. You're not even aware of the fact you did it. You will treat that person differently. That is, you will discriminate against that person without even aware of it. And research shows it takes about 300 milliseconds to blink the human eye. We make judgments about individuals, note their race, and make judgments about them in one third of the time it takes to blink your eye. In 100 milliseconds, we make these judgments. Implicit biases are normal, they're natural, they're subtle, they help us make sense of all the complex cognitive information we face every day by putting them into categories. They're developed as a part of being socialized in a society, um, but they guide our expectations and interactions with others. And even well-meaning uh, individuals can harbor deep-seated biases based on their socialization um, and so on. And just to, to give you a sense of, of how big a problem this is. The implicit association test um, is one of the most widely used tests to assess implicit bias. And its studies have focused on multiple groups, but most of its work has looked at anti-black bias. And it's fine, it has found for every group studied in the United States, with one exception, 70 to 80% of all persons have anti-black bias. So anti-black bias is not a rare thing. When I say 70 of every group, 70% of physicians, 70% of lawyers, 70% of teachers, 70% of all racial ethnic groups with one exception, have anti-black bias, because anti-black bias is so deeply embedded in American culture. The only exception to that is African-Americans. Among African-Americans, it's 
So even about one third of blacks have anti-black bias because it's not about your skin color, it's what's in your mind. It's what, how you were socialized. Um, so but what I'm saying is this is not a rare event in American society. This is a very common process in general. And Lisa Cooper and colleagues have shown that this implicit bias not only affects the quality of care provided, but affects the quality of the patient-provider relationship. In this study, and this, this study is a study where she, uh, she focused on uh, providers at safety net clinics um, um, in the greater Baltimore area. So these are people who care enough to work with the most vulnerable, and even among those providers, when there was implicit bias, they both videotaped the encounters and had objective ratings of them, as well as had patient reports. And on multiple dimensions, they document not the uh, poorer quality of patient provider interaction for those who score high on implicit bias. The good news is implicit bias can be reduced under certain conditions. Exactly, um, propranidol. <laughs> Uh, it reduces implicit bias, actually, this is not a joke, this is actually true. Um, I'm not sure that that's what I would recommend. Um, this work by Diana Purgis and all that suggests there are multiple factors that, that can reduce implicit bias. And I usually point to the Divine Solution, Professor Patricia Devine uh, from the University of Wisconsin-Madison has put multiple of these factors together in an intervention that has been the most successful yet documented in scientific research in terms of reducing implicit bias. So it begins, though, with acknowledging that you are vulnerable. I tell my students that I am a prejudiced person. Why? Because I like to think of myself as a normal human being. And if I am a normal human being, I am most likely prejudiced. I'm not saying I am racially prejudiced, because race is not the only basis of implicit bias and of group stereotyping, if you have negative beliefs about poor people, about women, about gay people, about fat people, about old people, we can just think of groups. Every society, this is not an American phenomenon, this is not about whites in the United States, this is about how human beings process information. And if we have a negative stereotype based on our socialization about any outgroup, these processes in fact operate. There's also a striking study um, in the area of HIV AIDS that found that when an uh, innovative measure of cultural competence was high, there were no racial disparities in care. Now, racial disparities are well documented for minorities in the receipt of antiretroviral um, medications um, and in viral suppression, but none of these disparities existed among these providers who were high on cultural competence. Now, this measure of cultural competence was a 20-item measure, and I'm not putting all of the measures here, but you can see an example of them. This is not typically how cultural competence is, is measured. So it's, it's physicians who said that family and friends were as important to health as medical doctors, that physicians should not ask patients about religion. That's reverse-coded, means that they should ask their patients about religion. Physicians who believe that social history contributes to how they care for their pa patients, that being white gives many privileges in the United States, that they are familiar with the lay beliefs that their patients have, that they're competent with patients from different backgrounds, that they ask their patients about alternative therapies they use, that they find out what their patients think is the cause of their illness. So there's a number of, of items um, but physicians who were high, who was a very special breed of physicians, if you look at the 20-item scale, um, suggest it does that no disparities exist among the patients who were high. There's also internalized racism. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to talk about internalized racism, but it refers to the extent to which some members of disadvantaged groups accept as true dominant ideologies about their group. So all of these measures of, of racism then affect differences, disparities in education and income and health and, and so forth. And these inequities themselves reinforce the stereotypes because people see the inequities and they say, uh huh, that's why these inequities exist. And the stereotypes go back to reinforce the structures of racism that operate in, this, in, 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 in the first place. So what can we do about these things? Number one, um, in this political moment, I want to say to keep America's health good and to improve it, we need to keep the safety net in place. 
And I want us to take a walk down memory lane at what happened earlier in our history when we savaged the safety net. That happened in the first year of the presidency of Ronald Reagan, where 500,000 persons were cut uh, from welfare, and a million people were dropped from food stamps, and 600,000 people lost Medicaid, and 250 community health centers closed across the United States, and a million children were dropped from school, uh, school meals, and the WIC program had only enough funding to serve a third of those eligible. What were the consequences for the health of America in the early 1980s when this happened. Um, we had a dramatic increase in pregnant women not receiving prenatal care, 143% increase in anemia in pregnant women, uh, increase nationally in the incidence of low birth weight, increases in infant mortality among poor populations in 20 states. In many cities, including Minneapolis, but Chicago, Boston, there were studies documenting children with preventable um, childhood diseases and increase in that, increase in children with elevated blood levels, and increase in chronic disease among individuals dropped from Medicaid. So we know from history that dramatic cuts in, in, and in the social safety net has negative consequences on health. What else do we need to do? We need to deliver care that addresses the social context. Care must go beyond simply dealing with the med presenting medical conditions to address the challenges in other individuals' life. As the World Health Organization asks this, what do we accomplish if all we do is treat illness and send people back to live in the same conditions that made them sick in the first place? And so we need to begin asking a whole set of new questions of how can we identify the non-medical needs and link and connect patients to local services and resources? How can we collaborate with other sectors to more comprehensively affect the needs of, of, of our patients? How can we connect our community residents to resources, including employment, that would help them? A couple quick examples of programs that do that. At the Boston Medical Center, a primary care provider uh, in the pediatrics can refer a patient to a number of specialists. One of the specialists the provider can refer to is a lawyer. The physician has on-site lawyers to solve the problems in the lives of their parents. It's called the Medical Legal Partnership. It's now in more than a, a 200 hospitals across the United States because a child with asthma in a moldy apartment will not breathe symptom free regardless of how much medication you give that child if the child goes back to live in the same conditions that triggered the problem in the first place. Health Leads is a program also born at the Boston Medical Center that doesn't use lawyers but now uses college volunteers. I have my undergraduate students volunteer with Health Leads and they are struck by the existence of a challenge, an existence of a societal resource to solve the problem and how difficult it is to get the two link. There are promising approaches, such as the Oregon, Oregon Medicaid program that is now facilitating collaboration between the healthcare sector and the service uh, providers. And here in Minnesota, the Hennepin Health Con Accountable Care Organization that is linking Medicaid beneficiaries and receipts of services with county provided social services, ensuring a seamless um, contribution of both. And I want to give you a study that Len Syme from Berkeley published back in 1978. Took 244 low-income patients, 80% African-American, randomized into three groups. One received routine medical care for hypertension, one got a health education of intervention once a week, go to a class where a professional taught you about education, and the third an outreach education. Um, took persons from the community, lay providers, trained them in the basics about blood pressure and why it was important, but also trained them in all of the resources that existed in the community to help people with problems that they face. And those persons made home visits, talked about hypertension, but also referred as necessary individuals for challenges they were facing. Seven months later, they found that patients in the outreach group were more likely to have their blood pressure controlled than in the other two groups. They knew more about blood pressure than patients in the other two groups and patients in the outreach groups were more compliant with taking their blood pressure medications. And among good compliers in the outreach group, the medication was twice as successful in controlling blood pressure. So everything a healthcare provider would want was evident in the outreach group. And for me, it reflects what happens when we treat patients not just as an organ system that is sick, 
but we understand their blood pressure or their health problem within the challenge of their lives. We also need to move further upstream to address non-medical determinants of health and to think of place-based solutions. So one of the things we need to do is to start early. And I want to give an example of the benefits of starting early by drawing on the Abyssadarian project in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. It's a project where kids um, birth through five are randomized to receive an intensive early childhood intervention, nurturing environment, good nutrition, high quality pediatric care. By their mid-30s, remember it's just birth through five what you provide for kids. By their mid-30s, lower levels of multiple risk factors of cardiovascular disease and metabolic disease. Uh, intervention, birth through five, reaping benefits at age 30. So here's an example of the systolic blood pressure differences between the control group and the intervention group. Uh, a large difference in systolic blood pressure in their mid-30s linked to what happened birth through five. We also need to think of what we do to dismantle institutional racism. Um, Barbara Reskin, a sociologist, has pointed out that racism is a system. It's multiple factors it affects, and it has its contributions. And that if we only address racism by addressing one aspect of the system, we are missing the interconnected nature of the system and the fact that there are these multiple pathways that if you only interject one, other act aspects of racism comes in to compensate for the fact you've only ad addressed one. And so what we need is a force that acts on every subsystem or that acts on key leverage points like residential segregation she identifies, and I think that's brilliant, um, that will have a ripple effect across the system. So one way to do that, for example, is to improve neighborhood and housing conditions. And we have an example of moving to opportunity, a case where poor how public housing residents were randomized um, to receive a voucher that moved them to a better neighborhood. 10 to 15 years later, all you did was change the neighborhood. It wasn't even a great neighborhood, but it was a less poor neighborhood. 10 to 15 years later, lower levels of obesity, lower levels of severe obesity, lower levels of diabetes risk. Those were the only health outcomes that were measured. This was not a health study. It was a study looking at the employment opportunities of moving individuals, but these were health outcomes that were assessed. Dramatic effect. Let me give you a fairly dramatic effect of what was done. They haven't measured health, but you'll see how dramatic the effects are. It's purpose-built community in East Lake, Atlanta. It's an example of an intervention where they decided we will address all of the challenges faced by a disadvantaged community simultaneously. So come with me to East Lake, Atlanta, um, where East Lake Meadows in 1995 was a public housing project with a crime rate that was 18 times higher than the national rate, when 90% of the families who resided in that housing project were victims of a felony every year, 90%. Public housing, 40% of the units deemed unlivable. Most adults were unemployed, very poor, one of the worst performing schools in the state of Georgia. Come with me to the villages of East Lake today. There's been a 73% reduction in crime, 90% reduction in violent crime. It's mixed income housing, 50% qualify for public housing, 50% market rate. Um, all able-bodied persons are employed and the school in each year is either the best or one of the best performing in, this, in the state of Georgia, even though 60% of the students still qualify for free lunches. So it's still most of the kids are poor, but dramatic transformation. What it illustrates is it can be done, and we can do it. The, the purpose-built communities will provide free consultation to any community who wants to replicate their models. One last point I have to make before I close. When we think of undoing racism and we think about particularly the healthcare sector, we need to think of what can we do to improve the diversity of the healthcare workforce in the United States. That is important because research documents that when we have a more diverse workforce, persons from underrepresented minority backgrounds are more likely to practice in primary care specialties and are more likely to work in urban and rural undeserved environments. 
and we have done some steps, but it's not enough to open the gates of opportunity. We need to ensure that everyone can go through the gates. So how well has affirmative action worked um, in the United States? And I think it's important to remind you that affirmative action policies implemented in the late 60s and 70s were designed for women and minorities. Most Americans think of affirmative action policies as designed only for minorities. Dramatic results for women. You could see in 1965, only 6.9% of graduates of medical school were women. Uh, in 2010, it was 48%. Today, it's 50%. Um, whereas for minorities, I go back even earlier to 1950, you could see where they were in 1960. So that today, we've moved from about 3% of medical school graduates being African American to about 6.5%, um, uh, 6 6 7% uh, uh, Latino, um, very low percentage of, of Native Americans, uh, uh, medical school graduates. So the question is, why did affirmative action policies work so much better for women than for minorities. Um, it highlights for me the critical need of making investments to ensure that we focus on the pipeline and that we prepare individuals to be able to take advantage of the open door of opportunity. And women were more prepared to take advantage of the doors because of the exposure and preparation than minorities were. So we face the reality today, a report from um, WAMC, that in 2014, there were 27 fewer African-American males in the first year of medical school than there were in 1978. And in the mid-1960s, 2.9% of all practicing physicians in the US were black. And in 2012, 3.8% of all practicing physicians in the US are black. 5.2% are Hispanic. Most of my students think we've made a lot more progress than that. And I think we need to really marinate the thought, the wisdom of Plato, that there's nothing so unfair as the equal treatment of unequal people. And I've demonstrated there's inequality across all kinds of domains. So if you use an equal treatment approach to unequal people, it is patently unfair. So I'm saying that racism in all its forms is alive and well today. It has its most powerful effects through institutional mechanisms that are deeply embedded in social institutions. We need to understand, acknowledge, and understand its effects. We need redoubled efforts to mitigate its pathogenic effects. And our biggest need is political will. Political will to do the right thing. We have the evidence that points us in the direction we need to do political will. I leave you with two uh, powerful quotations from two of my heroes. Um, Martin Luther King says, true compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It understands that an edifice that produces beggars needs restructuring. And Robert F. Kennedy says, each time a man or woman stands up for an ideal, or acts to improve the lot of others, or strikes out against injustice, he or she sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. And those ripples can build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. They are mighty walls of oppression and resistance. And it's my hope that each of you will be a tiny ripple of hope to make a difference for the lives of so many. Thank you.